Hey there. I gotta use a list to tell you the 29 things Juno is known for. I couldn't memorize it. And I had to think about this and put it in a sensible order. But right now, at this bridge, you can go across the bridge to the University of Alaska Southeast. It's not one of the things that Juno's famous for. It's here and it's important to us, but you probably haven't heard of it before. It's a nice little small school, but Juno is famous for what's behind me, which is the Mendenhall Glacier. You can't see much of it. You can't see anything of it in this light. There's just a wisp of blue over there in the summertime that you can see from this bridge. The glacier's gone down a lot since I've moved here, but it's still there. You've got the Mendenhall Glacier. Behind those towers you see in the back, those are the Mendenhall Towers. They're 7,700 feet tall, the tallest mountains. I'm just gonna look and make sure that you can see those there, yep. Those are the Mendenhall Towers, and the Mendenhall Glacier would be right down in there. So those are the tallest mountains you can see easily around Juneau. Behind the Mendenhall Towers is the Juneau Ice Field. It's 1,500 square miles of ice. It's not the largest in Alaska, but it's a pretty darn big one. Then, if you go south of here, um, uh, 50 miles as a crow flies, you get to Tracy Arm Fjords, which feeds off of the ice field that is just south of us. And Tracy Arms Fjord, the easiest way to get there is from Juneau. It's a wonderful visit and beautiful blue ice cascading into the sea. There are two different glaciers down there, North and South Sawyer. I try to go there every couple of years and I'm about due to go there again. Next is the fact that these trees you see around you are temperate rainforest. And I'm about to write, make a video on why temperate rainforest is one of the most important ecological regions to mitigate climate change. It actually um, conserves four times as much carbon as any other forest around the world. So it's kind of neat. I'll try to post that video. You can look for it on my website. Uh, my YouTube website, please subscribe, please like. I need to get those boosts so that I can get more following, so I can get more questions, so I'll have more questions of what to uh, answer. This one, you know, uh, the things that Juno is known for, this is 29 reasons. All right. <clears throat> I've got uh, Admiralty Island. It's a national monument. It is known as Fortress of the Bears. It has the highest density of brown bears. It's a thousand square miles and there's approximately a thousand brown bears on there. It's a very cool place. Years ago, I canoed across it. And yes, Virginia, I did see brown bears. <clears throat> um, then we have uh, Lynn Canal, which is just north of here. It's North America's steepest and deepest. It's something like 2,000 feet deep. And I got some locals coming by, so I'll probably redo this. Um, also known because it has no roads. It's the largest town in North America with no roads. Um, it was initially found. Hey guys, come on by. You guys want to be famous and be on video? Uh, I think I'm good, but thank yeah. you. Okay, how about the dogs? <laughs> it's his birthday today. Happy birthday, dude. <laughs> No, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't hit the tie pod. Nice to see you guys. Have a wonderful time. The only thing they're missing is a kid. It make it slightly better. But two dogs, you can't complain about that. <clears throat> so John Muir came here in 1879. He was coming through because he wanted to see Alaska. He was already famous at that time. John Muir has a gift of writing. He wrote about the gold-bearing region. He was an amateur geologist of Juneau. And so as a consequence, um, the very next year, in 1880, the, the Alaska Gold Rush started. Joe Juno, Richard Harris came to this region. It took them two trips because they kind of traded all of their goods for hooch, is what I heard on their first trip. But the second trip, Chief Cowhee, a young uh, native, was able to drag them here, and they found uh, gold nuggets the size of peas, and that was the gold, the first gold rush that was real, that had real lots of amounts of gold. It was in 1880 in Alaska. Uh, <clears throat> Then we have the uh, capital of Juneau, which was uh, founded in 1906. It is a beautiful building with, uh, with marble columns in front of it from Prince of Wales Island just south of here. Very, very nice and open. You guys can come up here and visit it. Uh, then you've got the Tongass National Forest. It's the largest national forest in the country. It's 16, over 16 million square acres. And a lot of it is actually not very good forest. They've cut most of the forest down low where they grow huge trees because that's where the valuable ones are. A lot of it is rock and snow cover, but hey, they're trying, they're trying. And it still does have tremendous numbers of trees. So then you've got the Birdman of Alcatraz. If you know that story, he started here in Juneau. This is where he killed his guy and that's why he got arrested the first time. 
uh, we've got the governor's mansion. It's beautiful. It's right there available every Christmas. Actually, today is Sunday on Tuesday. Um, I and anybody else in Juneau who wants to is going to go visit the governor. I'm going to take my whole family. We're going to do a picture with the governor. We do it every year. It's just a governor's open house. It's the coolest thing. And actually, I mean, I don't mean to be political, but the present governor is not particularly well liked by a very large uh, uh, demographic of Alaska. So I try not to get involved in that politics, but there won't be any line today. I'm going to be able to get all the cookies I want. The trick there is they turn up the heat in the, in the governor's mansion to about 80 degrees. And so you go in there because you're standing you're expecting if you're standing out in line you might be outside for an hour to get in you get in there and you immediately start cooking and there's no place to put down your jacket so they kind of chase you out with heat and that doesn't matter whether you're a democrat or republican when things are busy they need you to go through there quickly <clears throat> so uh, this is also the uh, the alaska state capitol um, we've got the building there were two different things one is the capital of alaska was 1906 and then the alaska state capitol that's the marble building i'm talking about uh, that was built in 1931. In 1942, there's a very interesting thing. It's called the empty chair. And I actually just found out about this when I was doing research on this subject, and it just struck home, and I remember hearing about it. But in 1942, a young man named John Tanaka was just about ready to graduate from uh, high school, and April 15th, they decided they had to incarcerate him because he was of Japanese heritage. And then in May when it was, and I'm just giving me goosebumps to think about it. The high school was a lot smaller than they are now, but the, the, the rest of the class, he was the valedictorian for the class, and the rest of the class stood up there, put up, went up on stage, and they set an empty chair on the stage for John Tanaka because he wasn't able to attend. His whole family and all the Japanese, 51, I believe, uh, citizens, sorry, not citizens, Japanese heritage Americans in Juneau at the time were uh, shipped down to Washington State to be incarcerated during the duration of the war. John actually ended up serving in the uh, battalion, U.S. battalion, that was almost exclusively made of uh, Japanese um, Americans, and they were sent over to Europe, and they had horrific death rates. They were thrown into some really tough issues. John survived. Uh, he lived for several years. They just recently uh, made this little little um, bronze sculpture, I believe it is, downtown. And I'm going to go visit that. To me, that strikes home, the whole idea of, you know, there was racism going on, but at least in Juneau, it was very favorable. Those 51 people after the war came back to uh, Juneau, and they found almost a completely they were allowed to remove into everything they'd done before reestablish their businesses etc because the people of Juno wanted them back very just heartwarming so on uh, next in the 70s was the discovery of bubble net feeding by humpback whales since I do whale watching this is near and dear to my heart but there was a high school biology professor who took his students out and he did articles after articles that he wasn't able to get scientists to be interested in, but he described the feeding behavior of humpback whales in concentrations, and it was groups of them. Along 15 years later, I think it was National Geographic or some scientific organization came up here, and they acted like they had just discovered something new, and he had to say, no, I told you about this stuff. I published newspaper articles. I described it as feeding behavior. It had been seen before, that they weren't sure what was going on. And so, to me, bubble net feeding, which is excitingly has just been seen in, um, it was it was only much, much later it was seen in Antarctica, and they just have seen it in Australian waters. So it's taking on, it's a socially learned construct. It's amazing. You can see 20 whales the size of us and weight of a semi truck pirouetting through the water and bursting out through the water at the same time. If they bump into each other very hard, they're going to get hurt. So it is a very skilled just it's just as big as seeing a thousand wildebeest on the Serengeti that was in the uh in the 70s then in 1974 we opened up our Eagle Crest ski area and I'll have to say that's on the wrong list because you guys certainly don't know anything about that in 1975 we opened up our Alaska Folk Festival same thing you've never heard of it it's famous throughout Alaska but it's not famous down south uh, 1980s we had a whole deal where all the money was coming out of the oil field. That's what Alaska runs on. And our governor, Egan, at the time, had heard through the grapevine that they were going to allocate out uh, money to the cities based upon, in part, the number of square miles. So he called a midnight session of the, of the uh, 
of the city assembly and they immediately annexed every bit of Alaska they possibly could. We ended up with 3,255 square miles of Alaska as part of Juneau. It goes all the way almost to all of the communities around us, goes right up to the Canadian border, includes a bunch of ice field and a bunch of water. It was, and it was a coup because we get a lot of money because of that formula. Uh, shortly thereafter, I believe Sitka and Yakutat just decided to annex a huge amount of wide open Pacific Ocean. So they are nominally larger than Juneau, but we're pretty darn up there and a whole lot of ours is actually land. So that's a somewhat famous thing. Uh, and going with that as well is we are the, um, the largest city in North, on North America that you cannot drive to. This is, except I'm standing on a bridge, but on both sides of this, uh, this, of this stream, and I don't know if you can see, but right down there, the water's not, not quite frozen yet, even though it's... Yeah. Well, there's a, crust, there's a crust of scuzzy ice on top of the uh, open-looking water. But uh, is that uh, this is the biggest city in North America that you cannot drive to. There's a bigger one, quite a bit bigger, down in South America, and I believe there's one in Asia. But still, we're 32,000 people, and you can't drive here, even though we're on mainland. I'll have to do another video on why you can't drive here. So then, in 1985, the Juno Jumpers got started. And when we came in here in 1993, it was a big deal going on. They'd gotten this critical mass because if you want to be a world-class football player, you have a hard time in Juno because you don't have anybody good to play against. And traveling and sports is really tough, but the Juno Jumpers had this feeding system from the elementary schools all the way up to the high school. And the kids, were very cooperatively teaching each other. And at one time, there were eight kids in the world that could do five unders. You know, jump up in the air and pass the rope underneath them five times. Juno had five of those kids. So it was just a world-class opportunity because the best athletes in Juno recognized world-class capability. Rather than playing football or basketball or some other sport, they did Juno jumpers as their primary sport. And so we got right up there and went to a world competition in Japan and did really well at a time when Japan was, or when Juno was barely known. Now, these other countries have blown us away with the number of people, it's become an organized sport, but for a while there, we were absolutely world-class. And it's still going on. I know uh, the young woman, um, I knew her as a kid that's now coaching it. And I knew her mother who, who helped a couple of my kids through the program. So from there, we've got Greens Creek Mine, which is the world's, I believe it's the world's fifth largest silver mine. It's been producing since uh, 1989. We've got the world's smallest Costco. It opened up in December of 93 within a few weeks of when I moved in, I think it, it moved, it actually opened up first and I got here within two weeks. And it's a tiny little footprint footprint Costco that all of the other Costco's that were that size have been replaced with big ones. But we've kept the small one and it keeps cranking out business and I keep asking them, making sure they're not going to close it. And maybe when you come up here, you should go shopping at Costco just so we can keep it open. It's very cute and very friendly. And I was just there actually today. It's amazing how much stuff they can put in. I, you go to the big ones and you know, it looks like there's a haze when you get into the far edge. Well, we've got all, most of the important stuff. I and mean, I go to other Costco's and other places and I regularly do shop the one in Nashville. It's very rarely I find something that I, that I haven't been able to find here that I need. So then in, in, the, in the mid, uh, in the uh, 1997 actually, the Juno Dance Drill Team actually were, I believe, world champions. Now, I'm not the expert on this, but I tried to do research because I remember these, world. I went and saw these girls and they were just amazing. They do this, I don't think they call it a dance off, where you take these kids and these are high school kids and the older you get, the smaller they look, but they got them all out, you know, you got the little ninth graders and you got the lot bigger, more mature 12th graders that just carry themselves like practically adults. But then they also got the instructors that are in their 20s and they got them all out there except for the one person who used, in this case, I think it was the senior captain that was guiding them all. And she started calling out things that they had to do. And as soon as somebody made a single mistake, they would drop out. And there are like 45 of these girls out there. And she started making longer and longer series of commands. And all these girls, having never practiced this because 
the senior student didn't even have a piece of paper in front of her. She was just m making random moves and they'd all be in perfect coordination and then two or three of them sit down. I couldn't even see what the mistake was, but they knew what it was. And you see them going and see them going and you get fewer and fewer people. And she's having to make longer and longer commands and they're, they're nailing them. The whole group is nailing every single move. It's a beautiful thing. And the year that we did it, there was a ninth grader that was out there until there were three kids left. You're just like, she's been practicing this for four months. How is she still out there? And it ended up being one of the older kids that won, but it was really, really impressive. Anyway, they won a world championship or a national championship, and I couldn't even find this information on their own website because it's still a big deal. Because one of the later things is that in 2019, they actually won what's called the the dance team military march i believe it was a national championship that's a big deal for a little town like this and it's that same it's that coordinated it's that teamwork thing rather than having individuals that are superstar they work on teamwork and coordination so i'm almost down to the end 1999 we got carlos boozer a fantastic good guy who grew up in this town he was a mountain of a man seeing him play basketball in high school kids would just bounce off of him and he won two state championship but i believe his senior year he didn't because i think they put four guys on him and the rest of the team just couldn't keep up but it was very fun and just so you know it's about 345 on a um uh, sunday afternoon december 11th and it's stinking dark I don't know even if you can see me, but I'm going to finish this off real quick. Um, 2005, we got the road to nowhere. The whole world, or the United States, found out that we got a whole bunch of money. I think it was $140 million to build a road from Juneau, even though the people of Juneau voted and said we didn't want it. Then 2006, we got Sarah Palin. Everybody remembers her. One of her first things she said was, we're not going to build the road, but we're going to keep the money. And in 2010, we got the Kensington Gold Mine. That might not be a big deal to you, but this is Gold District. We've got gold all around us on both sides of us. Kensington's up that way, Greens Creek's back that way, and over there is the downtown region that had all those millions of, you know, millions of ounces. Eh, I'm not, I've got to look at those numbers, but it was a whole lot of gold for a long time, the largest gold mine in the world. So there are some quick facts. I didn't quite go through them as fast as I wanted to, but maybe you recognize some of them and you can do some research. When you come on up here, every single one of those things can be can be studied and examined. You can go see the dance team go do their thing again, or you can go look at where the Birdman used to live. It's all here. It's all real, and I hope you enjoy it. Stay warm and dry, and I hope you have extra tufts. And I'm stinking cold.